Thank you, Brother Neville. This was kind of a, a surprise to me. I wasn't supposed to be here today, but uh, tonight's communion night, uh, and I thought I would drop down this morning, and I called Brother Neville, and he said, well, now, if you're coming down, said, why not just speak for us a little bit? And I thought, well, if I did come down and it was possible, I would not be preaching, but would just like to talk to the church a little while on matters that, you know, that I think would strengthen the church. Amen. We have just returned from our, from our fall hunting trip, the brothers and I here, and we had a glorious time. We're very, very grateful. All of us filled up and, and got our game that we were hunting for, and, um, and our pastor and I know that venison is very, very good. <laughs> and so we had some fine deer. And I got a bear and two deer. And um, we come back, and this is supposed to be the time that I'm to speak on those seven last seals. And uh, they didn't get the church ready. And uh, there's something hindrance that's caused it that... I think the city's given us a rough way because of not adequate parking room for the amount of people that we're, that the church will hold. We want a new church put up here, and we've got uh, a good part of the money already designated and, and to make a, a bigger church. But when we have these services, why, you understand what it is. It's such a pitiful thing that people are around the walls, out in the rain, and, and it's just awful. And even... Criticism comes from friends of mine. Said, Brother Branham looks like a doctor friend of mine. Said, Look like you could get someplace. Said, I feel sorry. Said, Pass by a nurse next door to me. Said, Well, I come by there one morning at five o'clock. You're supposed to be there. And said, The people are already gathering around that church down there. Five o'clock in the morning. You'll be there at 9 30. So, uh, see, and it makes it hard. And uh, we want a church that's got some room and where everybody can sit down and we think we're living in the last days. Believe that that we're the uh, we should be teaching the church of, of of these things that are shaping up the things that's been prophesied. Some of them thousands of years, and for at least twenty five and thirty years, right from this church that's been prophesied would come to pass, and now we have it Amen. coming right to pass. Amen. So we ought to be renewing these things, but we don't have adequate room. So this morning. I'd make him my calls and things yesterday, and I got a, some more to make this afternoon and so forth. And then I had a, uh, some people that wanted to come in, a lovely young fellow that's just a nervous break, a minister brother in the field, and uh, several like that, and a brother from Norway. And, and we had the little interviews back in the back room, and I said, well, now, we just step out, and Brother Neville said, well, we come out and say a few words to strengthen the church a little. Yeah, man. One of the first things that I want to say, I wrote down some things here on paper that when I come to the church, I wanted to say one thing I had wrote here was concerning the passing of our gracious brother Taylor while we were gone. Brother Taylor had been coming to this church for years and years. All of us knew him, I'm sure. So if there'd be some strangers here, it was that precious old gentleman that always found you a seat to sit down. Brother Taylor. Last time I saw him now, until I see him, a young man, he was standing there at the door about three or four Sundays ago. He said, I'd like to have some books, Brother Branham. I'd like to distribute these books. So we, he, uh, we understand he had diabetes and went into in a coma and didn't, not, not knowing he had the diabetes and, um, and was, uh, he died. Uh, he never died. He just went to be with the Lord Jesus. And he was a faithful, wonderful brother, always mindful of other people. And his delight was to try to find somebody a place to sit down when they come to church. And you know, maybe when we cross over the bar, wouldn't it be nice to see Brother Taylor there now? <laughs> Find us a place to sit down on the other side. I think in commemoration of Brother Taylor, I wasn't here to speak it with Brother Neville at his funeral, but I want to say a word of my appreciations. If 
his widow, Sister Taylor, I suppose, is here somewhere this morning. Bless her loyal heart. Brother Taylor, one day he said, come up and see me. I got a little lake dug up there. I put some fish in it so you come up and fish. Always mindful of somebody else. And there was somebody that was mindful of him. That was Christ to give him salvation. And I think in commemoration yet for this church as together as a body this morning, let us stand together. Bow our heads before God. Our Heavenly Father, we as uh, human beings this morning and the, the comers to this place of worship, Thy great hand has moved among us and taken from us one of our precious brothers who we love and know that thou did love him and you had a reason for all this Lord or it would not have happened in this way knowing that our Bible tells us that all things work together for good to them that love God and that he did and we look around in the world and we find the nature in every way speaking to us that the grave cannot hold him. For on earth he served the purpose that you sent him here to do. He was a good, loyal brother. We find that in the life of botany life and in the life of the sun that rises of a morning to give us light and in the Middle of the day, it becomes middle age, and then evening, it dies again, only to rise again the next morning, fresh and new, because it served God's purpose. We see the flowers as they bloom and beautify the earth and decorate the funeral halls and the wedding places and serves a purpose, opening up its heart and giving out freely honey to the bee and perfume to the passer. Beauty to the seeker gives all it has in a service for God. Then it bows its little head. But when spring comes around, it rises again because it served God's purpose. Then in the face of all nature and the Bible, the promise and the Holy Spirit, we can gladly rejoice in our heart to know that our brother Taylor likewise, Lord, served God's purpose. And to say that he would not rise again would be to deny our Bible, our God, and all things that God has given us to look at to know that there is a resurrection. So we are looking forward to the time when we shall see him again, when he is young and healthy and never to more to be sick or get old. Bless his precious wife, that loyal companion of his. How that we will miss them long, Lord, as we see them going together out to the pond and sitting on the little benches out there fishing and talking and how they were real sweethearts together. And now we know that there is the great day coming when the heroes of faith will march under the great ark of triumph and the angels of, with anthems will fill the air. We'll see them again in that place. Until then, Lord, give us courage. Bless us and help us. We'll long miss Brother Taylor and everyone who comes to this church. I would stand at the door and find a place for the comer to hear the Word of God to sit down and ease and rest. And the other day when he passed over, Lord, I prayed that the great archangel of God stood there at the door to find him a place too, Lord. He could sit down, for it is written in the Bible, the merciful shall obtain mercy. Until we see him, Lord, may the memories continue sweet in our hearts until someday when we meet again in the other land. Through Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen. <laughs> He will be long missed among us and amidst strangers and so forth that come to our church or our building here to worship. May his soul rest in peace before God.
till that day. Someday, too, each one of us will go one by one till we drop down along the line like that. Let us now, while we have time and can, let's prepare ourselves for that time coming. For we don't know when it will be. We don't know who will be next. Let us live so that each day, that if it should ever come, it will be for us, we'll be ready. Now, I would like to make an announcement. Now, soon, perhaps, maybe, I haven't talked with the trustees since coming back concerning the um, uh, condition of building the, the church here or what we have to do next, uh, getting our church uh, so we can have our meetings. Then I will continue on, pardon me, with um, the seven seals and then these seven vials and many things yet that we should be getting into right away. And now, next Sunday morning, there I am to be at uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky, with Brother L.G. Hoover to uh, a dedicational service. And uh, that's to dedicate a new tabernacle, or a tabernacle that they have bought at uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky, right down 62, uh, till you come to Elizabethtown, or right down, I mean 31, or down the turnpike, just at the turnoff, takes you to Elizabethtown, it's about an hour, it's about 35, 40 miles down there. I think about 40 miles by the way the of uh, 31, about 35 miles or something, the other way, or down by the turnpike. It's on Mulberry Street. Uh, the dedicational service, uh, Brother Hoover will have the regular Sunday school at 10 o'clock, and I'm to preach the dedicational service from 11 until 12. Uh, this next coming Sunday, November the 11th. On the bulletin board out there is a, a news item of it, and it'll be uh, at, uh, you can find your way from right there. It's on Mulberry Street, or they, uh, they give the directions uh, on the, it's on the bulletin board out there in the front of the church. <laughs> then on on November the the 22nd, uh, I'm to be at Shreveport, Louisiana, of the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, and um, and 26th, five days, I think, at uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, at Life Tabernacle. That's with Brother Moore. Uh, they are celebrating their uh, Golden Jubilee, the Pentecostal blessing uh, fell in Shreveport, Louisiana, 50 years ago, the 22nd of this month. 50 years, the first Pentecostal message was preached and fell, the Holy Ghost fell in Louisiana. And uh, they got a memorial to that, and this is a golden jubilee. And um, I'm to speak this jubilee five nights with Brother Moore at Shreveport. Life Tabernacle. If you've got any friends in and around there, why... That you want to write to or something, would we'll be glad to have them out and just uh, tell them about the meetings coming up. And um, the Life Tabernacle is, if anybody's ever been there with Brother Moore, he's a wonderful man, and there's a wonderful bunch of people, those old Southerners, you just can't hardly beat them. And uh, so uh, the Life Tabernacle, anyone around Shreveport can tell you where it's at. Shreveport's about 200,000 people, and it's a nice a city. And plenty of accommodations. Um, so, uh, and uh, the tabernacle is a large tabernacle, very large tabernacle. It's got upstairs and balconies and main floors and then a floor beyond that. And there's just plenty of room. And right straight across uh, from the city auditorium, it seats 5,000. Just, it's like crossing the street here to the city auditorium. And um, Reverend Jack T. Moore, our... Um, or either the Life Tabernacle at Shreveport, Louisiana. That begins on the 22nd, at be win uh, Thursday through Sunday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days instead of five, I'm sorry. Uh, that'd be the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th, I think that's the way it is, of, uh, of November. And then we'll find out then what about what we've done about the church here to find out how the church has progressed about getting its building. The contractors tell us they can put enough man on it to about 10 days. They can almost have it so we can go under it, see, right quick. And uh, they're just waiting for the city to sign, you know, and we have to have so much parking space and so much this and, oh my, it's a bunch of red tape to get into to start building anything. 
But I would like to get to the church before I get back to the field again. I, I got a call um, to Tanganyika, Uganda, and uh, through there, Joseph has the meeting set up to begin in February. And yesterday, when I come in, uh, there's some brothers and sisters, uh, Tom, the man from overseas, had come in and had, I had found a note laying on my door, or an invitation from a, an association down in South Africa. So I'm riding into them to find out just what uh, can be done. Maybe while I'm that far, I can drop on down in South Africa, maybe in, in the last part of February and March, along in that time. And we hope to get the church up so I can get these church ages in before uh, before uh, uh, the winter sets in, if possible. If it don't, or when I have to come back from over there, if the Lord Jesus tarries. I was listening yesterday when I was taking, uh, I believe it was the day before yesterday, of a tape. I thought I heard it playing out here this morning. Uh, some little southern brother had, uh, his mother had come into the meeting. She had a malignancy on her breast, and she was uh, shattered to death. And um, the Holy Spirit, in one of the recent meetings at uh, Southern Pines, I believe it was, yeah. or somewhere, told her, said about her malignancy and who she was and where she come from, and said she had a boy that was a backslider, and he was going to have a accident and be for manslaughter and a whole lot of things like that. And this fella, it all happened just the way in her malignant cancer, or malignant growth, rather, uh, left her, which is malignant growth is a cancer, you know. So then it, it left her, and the boy was up for manslaughter and everything just the way the Holy Spirit said it, and he was led to Christ back again. And uh, he made a tape of it, and I, I heard it playing, did you enjoy that? Little old Southern talk said down here in North Carolina, he said, <laughs> oh, I just love that, them old Southern people. And um, he had, uh, the Lord just blessed him on. He said, I know you say you don't preach doctrine, Brother Branham, only to your congregation. He said, we're part of your congregation. So that was right cute in him to say that. And now there is a picture. I think maybe it's on the bulletin board this morning. If it's not, Billy, I put it on there. Uh, many times it's been said, uh, when I first started speaking, that they said, you just imagine, Brother Branham, that you see that light, that uh, light. There's probably hardly, may might be some left here, the old timers that remembers back before the pictures was ever taken of it. Is there any here that remembers me saying that way long time ago? Look, just about... Four or five hands. Sister Spencer here, and um, brother, uh, Sister Slaughter, and, and brother uh, here, and brother over there. It's just about five or six of the old timers left. Well, now, after a while, the mechanical eye of that camera caught that picture. So it went to Washington, D.C., and went through the examiners and come back, not a no experience. Double exposure, nothing. Said the light struck the lens. That's George J. Lacy. You got his name signed. Well, then, many times you hear, look out, and say, there is a dark shadow over this person. It's shadowed to death. How many's heard me say that many times? See, many times. Well, it happened to be that the camera caught that, <laughs> yeah. and so we got that here. A lady that come to a sister. And I told her uh, in the meeting in, uh, in Carolina, where we had such a wonderful meeting at Southern Pines. And there, the lady was dying with cancer on both breasts. And the doctors, they give her up to die. And the lady just reached down and took her picture, just as I told her who she was and where she come from. And I said... There is a dark shadow over you. You're shattered to death. And the lady just snaps a picture of this, and there it is on the mechanical eye of the camera gets the shadow of death. If any of y'all seen the Ten Commandments and saw the death angel hide swept in that dark, gloomy looking shadow, it's on this picture. And I think it's on the bulletin board now. If it's not, uh, Billy can hear me while 
have him put it on the bulletin board, and it's got the arrow pointing to the person, and the person, the shadow left the woman and was miraculously healed. But there is like a hood of dark smoke gathered around and hooded over the lady and hanging off on that cancer, like that coming from that. Of course, that's the shadow where death is pouring in to, from the cancer. Well, no matter how much you try to tell people truth, there's somebody going to be suspicious that it isn't truth. Yeah. And um, if you always tell the truth, then you know you're, uh, you're right. Yeah. I have a friend that's a, a rancher up in the West, and, and the conservation paid about um, $4,000 for a snowmobile to count the herd of elk that was left back over off the Troublesome Valley. Mr. Jeffries, who said, you're in the church, uh, led him to Christ, a complete infidel. And you've heard me tell the story of us riding together, and he didn't believe in nothing but the ethics of Darwin and that baby born was nonsense. And uh, we camped the other night right where he accepted Christ. And uh, so then uh, this man uh, uh, told him, he said, now, I, you don't have to buy that automobile, that snowmobile. He said, I'll tell you exactly how many else up there. He said, he's 19. He said, there was, 20, there was 21, and I killed two of them. And he's talking to the game board. You're not supposed to kill but one. So he said, there was 21, and I killed two of them, and he's 19. And he said, yes, Jeff, I know you killed two of them. He said, I did. Well, they took the snowmobile and went up there, and there's 19 head out. He said, Billy, just tell a man the truth. He won't believe it. <laughs> so that's just about the way it is. You can tell people the truth, and yet they, there's been so much misunderstanding and and lying about things until they don't believe that you're telling the truth when you're telling them the truth, you see. But we're so thankful that we have a Heavenly Father who confirms that truth with a confirmation. Amen. It's truth. So then, if this shall be my last day on earth, the, even the scientific research and proofs has proved that I have told the truth about these things. Amen. That's right. It's truth. So... It'll probably be on the bulletin board. Uh, Billy, are you in the room there? You got it in your hand? Um, the picture? If you have, well, bring it out here, and then you can set it up here, and they probably stick. Well, I don't know there'd be a light on the, on the board. And uh, here, is the, here is the picture right here. I guess you can't see it, but right here you can see that hooded shadow of death over that woman's head. And here is the write-up about it back here where the lady took the picture and to see if it actually showed. And there it is. Uh, on, on there, it's a hooded shadow of death. You've seen it, I guess. Yeah. So, Billy, I'll probably put it on the bulletin board, if you will, Billy. I'll come get it and take it around the front and put it on the board so everybody can see it as they go out here or dock either one. Now, I thought maybe it could show plain enough that you could see it, but there's too much dark uh, uh, for that type of picture. But he'll have it out there so he can see it as it goes out. Now, remember all the announcements. And now, this morning, I thought maybe that we would speak a little bit on something to encourage the church. Something that would give you uh, a, a more... What's that? Uh, yes, Doc, if you will. It might be good. I want to use this shirt. I had some of them didn't have it to put on from last week, so we thought maybe that it would give a little better for today. I wanted to talk on it because it pertained to a, a dream a sister had. I wonder if Sister Shepherd is in the church this morning. I met her the other night, and the first time I'd seen the woman, actually, I didn't even know who she was. Is she, I guess she's not. Yes. Would you mind, would it be anything out of the way if I referred to that dream, Sister Shepherd? You wouldn't mind, would you? All right, sorry. And um, before we approach that, let's bow our heads now again. Gracious Heavenly Father, to Thee we give praise for all Thy goodness and mercy. And now quietness down, Lord, that we might study the Word of the living God. As it comes to us through vision and is confirmed by the Holy Spirit, backed up by the Bible, 
So we pray that you'll give us understanding that we might know what to do in these last days as we see the evil powers settling around us now. The battle, the final battle is just about to be fought. Help us, Lord, as real warriors, strong. Let us keep the shield of faith up with the word of God, the sword, and move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, <clears throat> thinking of moving forward, a battle, like a, a battle set in array, ready to go into action, uh, a real battle to fight the fight of faith. Um, Sister Shepherd here and Brother Shepherd, who are very gracious friends of ours and who come to this tabernacle. And they are a precious children of God. And, and this um, Sister Shepherd, when I was picking up my mail, the kind that Billy can answer, just somebody say, send me so many prayer cloths and I pray with them. He just answers them back. But when it's an individual letter, I have to answer it myself, you see. So I picked up my individual mail. And so I was um, uh, taking it home, and I was reading in there, it said, from Sister Shepherd, And it was a dream that she had had uh, uh, some months ago. And she never could get it just right until two or three Sundays ago when I taught on this this. Um, Seven church ages and and uh, the the seven fruits. Second Peter, how it takes to Second Peter one to add to our faith. The first foundationally is faith. Second, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge. From knowledge, temperance. From temperance, patience. To patience, godliness. And from godliness, brotherly love, brotherly kindness. And then love being the capstone, seven of those things, seven church ages, see, and seven stars of the church ages, and all of it is tempered together by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what it takes to become a servant of Christ. Christ builds his church in seven church ages, his bride, a person, woman, church, seven Church ages constitute and make the bride. Some out of this age and some out of that age and some out of that age and all together. And shaping it like a pyramid. Like Enoch who built the pyramids that we believe and the capstone never was put on top of them because the headstone was rejected. And we take it out not as doctrine, but as to understand just for the church here that these God makes Himself perfect in three. He makes Himself perfect in Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Three offices of one God. He makes Himself perfect in justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Ghost. Come perfect works of grace. He makes Himself perfected in three comings. First time to redeem His bride. Second time to receive His bride. Third time in the millennium with His bride. And everything is perfected in threes, and seven is the worship number of God. God is worshipped in seven. Completed. Now, perfected and completed. And the strange thing was, not to bring this in, but just to show you, the last deer that I got had five points on one side and three on the other. <laughs> three, grace and perfection. Now, notice on this that Christ, God wrote three Bibles. The first Bible was in the sky called the Zodiac. Now, if you don't know the book of Job, just forget about it. Because Job is the one who explains it. How did he look up and he named those things in the sky. And notice in the Zodiac, what did it start off with? The first thing in the Zodiac is the virgin. The last thing in the zodiac is Leo the Lion. The first coming of Christ through the virgin, the second coming, Leo the Lion, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Then Enoch 
completed in his day or back in that day a pyramid. And, it was, of course, you haven't got time to background it and show how that, that pyramid come up through the chambers and so forth. This speaks right straight to the end time now. They're in the king's chamber now by the measurements. But the headstone never was put on the pyramid. And that's such perfect architecture or, or masonry until even a, the little thin razor blade. And they don't know how they ever build it. Don't understand. Could ever a razor blade slice along the sides where that mortar should be and there's no mortar in it. It's just perfected, put together. So that's what it is when Christ and the church becomes one. There's no martyr between. There's nothing between. Just God and the person. God, Christ, and the person. Now, but the headstone, they've never found it. You know, the stone of scroll they have in England to uh, ordain the kings or to, um, to crown them and so forth. But the headstone, notice on the American dollar bill. You'll see if on the American dollar bill, on the one side, the left side, is the American seal, an eagle with the uh, spears in his hand. On the second side, this is called the seal of the United States. But on the next side is the pyramid. And above it, a great eye. And under here it says the great seal. Why would it be the great seal in this nation? even above the seal of our nation. See, no matter what you ever do, God makes us speak just the same. See? He makes the sinner speak of it. He makes the nation speak of it. Everything you have to speak of him. Whether you, you want to believe it or not, it's right there. Now, notice he's an eye in that, the eye of God. And because that the cap didn't come off the head seal, because it was rejected, which was the Son of God. The cornerstone of the building, the head seal of the pyramid, and all this. Now, now, I'm, I don't like to. Sometimes they take these things, and it gets out amongst brethren in churches, of other churches, and when they do that, then the brethren sometimes gets a wrong impression that I'm saying something about brethren, but I'm not. I. If you could just listen and understand, Amen. see, I am not speaking against any brother, because that's not becoming to brethren to speak of yeah, each but... other. We should speak for one another, not against Amen. each other. But when I speak sometimes of certain organization, like Presbyterian Methodist or so forth, they say, see, he's against it. I, I'm not against the brother in there or the sister in there. The system that's separating brotherhood is what uh, uh, I speak against. God's children are one family and not, and not different groups. And some of say, I have nothing to do with it because that's Presbyterian and I'm Methodist. See? Now that isn't... See, it's the system of that organization that breaks up that brotherhood. See? Now that, like I've said, if you were going down the river in an old uh, shaggy looking boat is going to try to make the falls, and I know that that isn't going to work, well then I'm not screaming or rebuking you, I'm trying to get you out of that boat, <laughs> see, because it's the boat that's going to break up and, and, uh, and you'll be left sitting alone in the water. <laughs> so so it's, not, it's uh, not the brother in the boat, but I'm hollering at the brother to show him what's fixing to happen. Well, all these systems that man has made in their achievement has got to break up. That's all. They Amen. have to come. We have to come to unity, to brotherhood. That's been my purpose of life is to try to unite and not break up an organization, but let them drop their ideas and be brothers to every born again Christian. Amen. That's the idea. That's where I've stood. Well, now, if the brother would notice it, I. Many of our brethren, even in our full gospel ranks, they do not believe that the Baptists and Methodists and the Lutheran and them have a chance. But I, Now, they may be right, but I don't agree with that. I believe it's the age here of the Lutheran age, in this age here, which was called, I believe, the Sardis age, and then the Philadelphian age for the uh, Methodists, and then the Pentecostal Laodicean age. I believe those are ages, and God 
in each one of those ages took an elected people. And in that, as Hebrews 11 says, that them without us is not made perfect. Amen. See? But now the church has come from this coming in a minority all the time till it's down into the Pentecostal age. Now the reason I'm saying this is that you might get an idea on what the sister dreamed. And her dream is certainly comparison to what I've been teaching. Notice. Now here. Now all these things that First Peter, the 6th and 7th verse tells you, from, by your faith, that's first. Now I say that people claim to have these virtues without even being born again. And I believe I made a rude remark and says like a blackbird trying to put peacock feathers in himself and make himself a peacock, he can't do it. There has to be a natural feather growing from him. The inside of him has to put that feather out. And always, and I've always been accused of being hard on our sisters about wearing bobbed hair and manicure all over their face and stuff. I've always been accused of being hard on our sisters. It, it is that I got anything against that. I don't say the woman isn't a good woman, that she's some uh, street walker or something. That isn't my attitude. But it's this. When she puts so much artificial on the outside, shows there's a lot of artificial on the inside. See, we ought to be filled up with Christ because the outside always expresses what's on the inside. By their fruits, you know them, you see. And where Christ ought to be in there and the cure for the God and the cure for uh, other things instead of so much artificial pomp and you know, green eyelids and unhuman looking and all that kind of stuff. I just don't go for it. And uh, I don't believe the Bible does either. So I, uh, I like to be just what we are. Notice, now, if she hasn't got uh, any fingernails and wants to put some on, if she hasn't got any uh, uh, teeth and needs some, haven't got an arm and you need one, haven't got hair and you need some, you haven't got these things, that's different. But when you pull out your real good teeth because they're just not as bright as you should be, then you're done wrong. Amen. If you've got red hair and you want black and you go down here and color it black just because you're done wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But the main thing, there's no scripture for that only to bob your hair. There's scripture for that. Yeah. That's plenty of that. So then we want to be sure that that's right. Now, now our sister in dreaming, she dreamed that she, well, first she was disturbed. What's the use of going on and trying to struggle through life if God requires us to receive the Holy Ghost and we don't have it? Now, I don't think, they may be taping this, but if they, don't, if they do, it's for the church alone. Now, if some brother would get a hold of this, and you hear my voice, brother, on this Remember, I'm just teaching to my church. You always, before your congregation, examine the, the tapes. And if you don't want your congregation to hear them, don't let them hear them. But I, I'm just trying to say to this a little group here that I, as Brother Neville and I, by the Holy Spirit, is trying to, to Amen. pastor Amen. and um, to teach them. Now, some of these things you might miserably disagree with. So if there is, just like I always said about Eating fried chicken, when you hit the bone, you don't throw the chicken away, you just throw the bone away. <laughs> so, always do that. Eating cherry pie and you run into a seed, you wouldn't throw the pie away, you just throw the seed away. So, you do the same thing in listening to this. Now, I, I believe that at the, the reason that there's so much confusion today about the Holy Spirit is not correctly taught. I believe that the baptism is taught, and just say, the baptism, but then the, like you say, automobile. But now, uh, I've got several mechanics in this church, and I don't know one thing about it, so if I make a mistake, brethren, I'm not, remember, I'm not a mechanic. There has to be coils and plugs and points and valves and everything else that makes the automobile. And when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's a lot goes with that. Hmm? See, there's a lot goes with that. And here's what I think that God is proving the Holy Spirit is here. See, now Peter said, first, faith. Now watch it real close now. We're going to teach this for a few minutes. 
faith. Now, is your first, and add to your faith, virtue. To your virtue, knowledge. To your knowledge, temperance. To your temperance, patience. To your patience, godliness. To your godliness, brotherly love, brotherly kindness. And then, love. And anyone knows that love is God. Amen. God is love. Amen. See? Now, that then from this, and then bringing this into the seven church ages, God is building in seven church ages a bride for Christ. Amen. Through the Philadelphian, Thyatira, and Ferguson, Samaria, and Ephesus, a church age that Jesus said, if the, if the bridegroom come in the first watch or the seventh watch, Amen. all these virgins awakened. They were they woke. The virgins of Ephesus, Samaria, Pergus, Thyatira, Cyrus, Philadelphia, and Lady Osea. Did you notice that? It was the seventh age that when he came and woke up those sleeping virgins. That brings them all the way back down to here. See? For in this, through the years, ages, he has built a bride. Born a bride. Begotten a bride on earth for Christ. And the same way that he begets this bride, he has begot individuals. Now, I'm backgrounding this so that you will see when the sister's dream is being told. Now, these things here absolutely must be in the Christian before the Holy Ghost ever seals them. Before this comes down on top and makes a complete unit. Now, our sister, three now, she was worried whether she had the Holy Ghost or not. When she laid down a, across the duopole where her husband was reading a paper, and she's got little ones as I have, and they're always making a noise and things, and so in this, she fell asleep for approximately 10 minutes or 15, and she dreamed, and she never could understand it or get it all together from a year ago almost until this message was taught. Then while I was teaching, it all come back to her. And she dreamed that she was praying. She's walking the floor first before she dreamed, and wringing her hands and thinking, Lord, have I got the Holy Ghost? Can you prove to me? Some says because of... And I shouted her. Some said because I spoke with tongues. We believe in all that. But have I really got it? I believe in all those things, those virtues. Speaking in tongues and shouting and all kinds of demonstrations. I believe in every bit of it. But if it's there without this, there's something wrong. Amen. Uh, see, you, see you, you got a shell. Notice. And she was worried about it. So she just laid down across the dual pole where her husband was reading, and she went to sleep, and she dreamed she is up on a mountain. And in this mountain, the best, I haven't got the paper before me, but I think it's like this. She dreamed that she saw a, a rock box, like, like a, a framework, setting right in top of this mountain. And her husband was just behind her. And she saw a large man standing there, with work clothes on, sleeves rolled up, bailing the most pure water that she ever seen and pouring into this box. This rock box sitting in top of the mountain. And the rock box would not hold the water. And it rolled right out of there and it's boiled up all the trash and sticks and everything in there and boiled it out and rolled down the mountain. And it rolled over her feet and she was standing right in that stuff. Only it didn't stick to her. And... And then uh, she asked why the box didn't hold it. And the man said, that is not water. That's the Holy Ghost. And said, nothing will hold it. And said, then he went back and got another big bucket. And it was full of honey. And poured the honey into there. And said, now it'll hold this. And she thought that the box was, a rock box is going to burst out and spill the honey. But it didn't. It finally stuck together and held it. She turned and went down the mountain. Going down the mountain, she stopped at the bottom of the mountain and looked back. She saw five streams of this pure crystal water, not contaminated by the things that it went through, still pure and clear, coming swiftly. Then it slowed up, then almost fading out. 
And she was wondering, would it ever reach the bottom of the mountain, five streams, and she woke up. I think that's just about close to being right, isn't it, Sister Shepherd? Now, no more than I picked up the letter and opened it, before I read it, I saw her dream. That's the way dreams are interpreted. Now, many of you have come to me with dreams and, and say things to me about dreams. I said, wait a minute, she never told it all. See? And go back and pick it up. Then, if you can't tell what you dream, how you know the interpretation's right or not. See? You've got, to ha- you've got to see the dream. A vision has to show the dream. And when you see the dream that the person dreamed, they can tell them before they tell you. Then you know the interpretation. Well, I believe that's in the Scripture also. Daniel one time. Wasn't that right? Amen. said, yeah, I believe I just happened to think of that then. See? But you always see the dream. Now, if the interpretation's right, a person starts telling you a dream, you can stop them and say, wait a minute, and it was so-and-so plus so-and-so plus so-and-so. And then you say, that's exactly right. See? A man the other day was trying to tell me a dream that he dreamed. He said, well, he said, uh, I said, now, brother, why did you leave out that other part? <laughs> He said, what other part? I said, you dreamed that you threw a rock up in there and I shot it and got some mine. He said, that's exactly the truth, Brother Brown. And they just picked the last part of it out yesterday. <laughs> so there you are. See, you see, why do you don't li- tell the truth of it? But you see, it always reveals back what tells you your dream, what you dreamed. Then you know it's right. Now, here's the interpretation of her dream. She was bothered about the Holy Spirit. Now, insomuch as she seen the box on top of the mountain was the rock. Rock box is rock confession. Now, like Jesus said uh, in the scripture, he said, um, uh, Peter said, uh, who, uh, Jesus said, who does man say, I, the son of man, am? One said, thou art lies, Moses, and so forth. And he said, but who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, some people say, now the Catholic Church says, the Roman Catholic Church says, that his con- what the rock was that Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They said it was upon Peter. And Peter was that rock because Peter means little stone. Now, upon this little stone I'll build my church. And upon Peter they... Uh, apostolic succession, they built the church. Then the Protestant church says, that's wrong. That it was upon himself he built the church. Now, not to be disagreeable, but I, to my way of seeing it, it's both wrong. Because he never built it upon Peter, neither did he build it upon himself, but it's upon Peter's revelation of who he was. See, who does man say, I, the son of man, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, some seminary. But my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed to you. Thou art Peter, upon this rock of confession, upon this revelation, I'll build my church. And that's been each church age has had that rock confession on up to this rock confession of the Lady Osea. And now, you cannot make a holy church. There's no such a thing as a holy church or holy organization. The Holy Spirit can be preached in it, but in there you find good and bad, renegades and different and everything else. So an organization will not hold. You can't say, we got it. None of the rest of them has it. No, sir. The Holy Spirit is poured out on individuals. It's the individual. So therefore, the rock, this Latter-day Pentecostal church, which has received the Holy Spirit, they did at the first, all down through the ages. They received the Holy Spirit, but not in the measure that they have it now. Because it's a restoration of the first. As we take the candlesticks, Alpha and Omega, how they lit the first candle, it went higher and higher, and got dimmer and dimmer, and then come back again, see? First and last and so forth. Now, but in this church age, the message is being poured into the church, but the church body itself, in all together like the, this tabernacle, we'll say. That's where she comes to church. This tabernacle is not a Holy Ghost tabernacle. There's no such a thing. Uh, individuals that come into this church is Holy Ghost tabernacles. They are tabernacles that contain the Holy Ghost. 
but not the church in the body of group. Therefore, it runs out. But what this man who was pouring the water, the messenger to the church, pouring the message into the church, but what was the water doing? It was boiling out all the trash that was in it. That's what the Holy Spirit does, boils it up. Now, now the honey represented brotherly love, brotherly kindness, which is this age. I just got through telling me. See? A brotherly kindness, the age that we live in now. Now, you might say, look, I, I, I sure don't like Brother Neville. Or I sure don't like Brother Jones. I don't like Brother so-and-so. And something like that. But just let something happen to him. Brother, your heart's broke. <laughs> it just nearly killed you. See? We can't obtain brotherly kindness and feeling for one another. See? But to maintain in a group of people, why do you care for that, brother? Because you broke bread with him here at the altar, as you will tonight. Amen. You fellowship with him. You shuck his hands. You worship with him. He's your brother. And he might do something in the flesh that you would disagree with because you just kind of stay uh, what you ought to do, but uh, shun him a little. But in the bottom of your heart, if something happened to that brother, it would just nearly kill you or that sister. I'm, I'm an old man. I was once young and now I'm old. I've seen it down through the age do that. Here people say, oh, I just won't have no more to do with him. And something happened to that man, it nearly kills him. He thinks, oh, God, I'll let my precious brother go without making friends with him, you see, again. See? See, it's brotherly love. It looks like it won't stick, but it does stick. The honey, it sticks. Now, in so much that she come from there down the hill to the bottom of the hill, now this glorious water was gushing over the hills in five streams. Now, five is the number of grace. J-E-S-U-S. F-A-I-T-H. G-R-A-C-E. See? Five is the number of grace. Five streams was pouring from up here at the trough down to here. Each one of these ages had that rock confession. The saints are sleeping, waiting, waiting, waiting. Waiting, see, on to this age, but soon the Holy Ghost being poured out from Christ will come and will seal up the church. Then the church will be raptured. It'll be a complete unit of God, a bride for Christ, who will be the head of all things. You follow me now? Now she was wondering... Now, in her dream, she was wondering, would this little stream, would this little stream ever get to the bottom? See? It was drying up. Now, being that she herself, now here's what I want you to get to now. She herself was wondering about her own self. Did she have the Holy Ghost? Now, Shun saying this a few days ago, thinking that the church would be spiritual enough to catch it. And maybe I better turn this tape off right now. But, because I don't want to get out amongst the brethren. But, you could speak with tongues, you could shout, you could dance, you could cast out devils, do anything you want to, and still not have the Holy Ghost. Didn't them disciples come back rejoicing and shouting because the devils are subject unto them? And Jesus right among them was Judas... Did not Jesus say in that day when he comes that many will come to me and say, Lord, have not a cast out devils and in your name done mighty works. And I'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I didn't know you. Those things are not indications of the Holy Spirit. By the fruit you shall know them. Hey. Now, you say, Brother Bram, did we, should we speak with tongues? Absolutely. That's gifts of God. But those gifts of God without these virtues in them... It makes a stumble block to the unbeliever. It's not accepted by God. This has to be first. And when you have faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, and brotherly love, then the Holy Ghost comes down and seals you as a unit. As same as He seals the church ages as a unit. The way He makes His bride is the way He makes His individual. 
Made out of the same material like Eve was made out of Adam, a rib from the sun. Here is the things that you have to have first. You can't impersonate them. You can't imitate them. They've got to be God sent and God born. Amen. Imitation only causes confusion. It's like I said, could you imagine seeing a buzzard sitting there with a dove feather stuck in his wings? They see I'm a dove. <laughs> he's not a dove, he's a buzzard. Vulture. Could you imagine a blackbird with a peacock feather in his wings and saying, see? That's something he's stuck in. But it has to come from the inside out and produces Christianity. God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, our sister had her feet wet when she got to bottom. All of us know Sister Shepherd to be a charitable. Her house is open. Her and brother, I don't care if it's a bum beggar or whatever it is, they'll feed him, do anything they can to help him along. Oh, God accepted that. Her foundation part. And here's, now, get this lesson. Here is what's wrong with the, with the, I'll turn over this. Here's what's wrong with the Branham Tabernacle. You see, there is two different kinds of faith. There's two different kinds of virtue, as I had the other day. Two different kinds of knowledge. Two different kinds of temperance. One thing is probation. You got, that ain't the kind of temperance that God's talking yeah. about. It's that ungodly, uncontrollable temper you got in things of that side. Fast back fuss. Patience and so forth. There's a mockery of it, a pretending to be a nature given faith, a nature given virtue. There's a nature given temperance. All these things, a nature given. And the biggest part of our faith is mental faith. Yeah. By hearing the Word, it brings us to a mental rec recognition of God. But if this coming from above, yeah. oh, brother, if it ever strikes this, there is a godly spiritual faith. Amen. Then, what does that faith do? That faith recognizes only the Word. Amen. No matter what anything else says, it only recognizes the Word because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Amen. And the Word is still God. Amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And when the Word itself is pouring into our faith, yeah. our mental faith becomes a spiritual revelation. Yeah. And upon this foundation, yeah. I'll build my church. Amen. Amen. Not upon a mental conception of church joining, a mental conception of that, but upon the revelation when them streams of grace has poured into that mental faith that you've got. Then upon this a spiritual revelation, I'll build my church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That shows they would be against it, but it'll never prevail. Oh, what a glorious thing. Now, see, the faith, these five streams, I had a piece of chalk here, but I guess he never brought it out. But the five streams, you see, coming down through here, tempers this together. It's been the Holy Spirit that made the Ephesus church. Amen. It was the Holy Spirit that birthed the Sumerian church. Amen. It was the Holy Spirit that gave the Pergamus church and the Thyatira church in the Dark Ages. It's the Holy Spirit that's built that rock. The elect is pulled out of all the organization systems down through the ages like that. There's an elected, Amen. a predestinated Amen. bride of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit has called out the elect. Amen. And it's been the Holy Ghost in this age, that age, that age, that, 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 that on to the top. Amen. The Holy Spirit. Uh, and now, as in the individuals, these virtues and things, or knowledge and tempers, is added to our faith, then when the capstone comes, the Holy Spirit cements it together. Amen. Hallelujah. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's Amen. so short today. Praise Let me see here. i got some text wrote down here. Let's see. I had a picture drawn here for her dream. You can't see it from there. Now... Coming from the Holy Spirit, 
what has come, then He will give to you supernatural faith, spiritual faith, that here at the bottom, then that spiritual faith recognizes only the Word. Amen. No matter what anybody else says, they don't, they don't do no good. That only knows the Word. Now, somebody say the days of miracles is past. That faith only knows the Word. Somebody says there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That faith only knows the Word. Hallelujah. That's real spiritual faith, you see. That's right. See? It only knows the Word. Man, that was number one. Number one, coming to you, your mental faith, right here, comes the Holy Spirit coming down into your mental faith, making it a spiritual faith, and the spiritual faith only recognizes the Word. Now, in number two, uh, three, then you'll have spiritual you be have the Holy Spirit and will seal all these things into you as that Holy Spirit covers this from your faith up to the Holy Spirit seals you in with Christ. Amen. Then you become Amen. one. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Get this thing on the way. Hallelujah. your arms. Yeah. You become one. See, you and Christ Amen. live together. Hallelujah. At that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, the Father in me. I and you and you and me. Praise God. Then that's a sealed unit of the Lord God. Now, and then they are vindicated and placed. When that time takes place, they become vindicated sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. Do you remember over in the book of... Um, Matthew, the 17th chapter, the first to the fifth verse. Jesus on Mount Transfiguration. You've heard me. Hear ye him. That sermon I just hear about a year ago preached. Become so popular. Hear ye him. The placing of a son. In Ephesians 1, 5. Also, God has predestinated us unto the adoption of sons. See, a family, when a son is born into it, it's a son man. But that son had tutors to raise it. And if that son never did come to the to be the right kind of a son, he never become heir. But if he was the right son and the son that would obey his father, then that son was adopted or placed positionally. He become heir of what the father had, Amen. and that's what God was doing on Mount Transfiguration when He took His own son after He had been proven to be the right son. See, and it stood all temptations. He took him up on Mount Transfiguration and overshadowed him. You know, in the Old Testament, they took a son, dressed him in a nice, pretty garment, and set him out before the public. And they had a ceremony of placing, or we call it adopting. In Galatians, there, I think Paul refers to it as adopting son. Yes. Now, but placing a son, ministers will understand, and spiritual Bible readers. A placing this son. In other words, the son was the son when he was born. That's where our Pentecostal people made their mistake. Being born into the family by the Holy Ghost, that's right. But then we must be the right kind of children tutored by the right tutor. Amen. See, now, if a man back in the old age thought of uh, his son, and he wanted him to be a right kind of son, he got the best tutor he could find, the best teacher. Because he wanted his son to come up to be like his daddy. Amen. See? So he got the right tutor. Now, if a man on earth would think of the best tutor, how about God our Father? Amen. Now, he never got bishops and cardinals and priests. He got the Holy Ghost to be our tutor. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Amen. And he, he's in the church. And he takes message to the Father. And then, what if the father, the tutor, come up and said, Well, Father, I, he ain't going to get some kind of a tutor that wants a straw in his hat, you know, a feather, we call it. Say, Oh, if I tell the father something about that little boy, he's a renegade anyhow, but if I, if I tell the father, the father might give me a raise. That ain't the right kind of a tutor. The right kind of a tutor is honest. Amen. Tell the truth. And the Holy Ghost tells the truth when he comes before God. Go up. Yeah. So he comes up. Why do you think he'd blush today to say, your daughters are all cutting their hair. <laughs> you told them not to. Hey, Your sons are so organized minded, they just simply yeah. can't see one to the other. Not, right? And they're adopting this for this and this for that. How he must blush. But how that tutor would love to come and say, Oh my. Hey. That son's a real son. 
He's just like the father. Oh, how he'd love to say that, see. Then the father swells out in pride and says, this is my son. That's exactly what God did on Mount Transfiguration. Amen. And notice that appeared Moses and Elijah. And Peter, all excited, the supernatural was done. The, Peter got excited. He said, let's build three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was yet speaking, God shut him up. Amen. He said, this is my beloved son. And whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. See, God put himself in the background and this is my son. Moses represented the law. The prophets represented his justice. We could not live by his law. Uh, we could not live by his justice. I don't ask justice. I want mercy. Amen. Not justice. Yes. I can't keep his law. And I can't meet his justice. But I need his mercy. Amen. And God said, the law and justice has been met in him. He's my beloved son. There he him. That's him. That's the one. Now in the Old Testament, when that son was adopted or placed into the family, his name was just as good on the check as his daddy's was. Amen. Yes, sir. They didn't have a, they had a ring in them days, a, a sign, signet. And they'd spit on it, place it. That was a signet. That was just as he wore his daddy's ring. His signet. And that was just as good as his daddy's. Amen. Now, when Jesus had been obedient, Jesus to God, God placed him positionally, this is him. Amen. Now, when the member is born by the Holy Ghost into the family of God and is proven to have these virtues in him, that God can see virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness and godliness in him, then God seals him or places him. Amen. There, that's when you see the sons and daughters of God. Then Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of your redemption. Uh, now some of you Baptists that want you to go on eternal security. Now, if you'll come to that stage, I'll stand with you in eternal security. If you'll come to that place. But just to say anybody says, I'm going to join the Baptist church. I'm a Presbyterian. I've got eternal security. That's wrong. Your own life proves you haven't got it until this is there. And God has adopted you and sealed you by the Holy Ghost into his kingdom. Then there's no getting out of it. You are eternally secured. Believe, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby all you and your godly virtues are sealed until the day of redemption. I believe there is a bride that's predestinated. I believe God said he would have a church without spot or wrinkle. I believe in predestination that the bride is predestinated. She's got to be there. I hope I'm with her. (laughs) See, I'm with her. Now it's up to me to work out my own salvation with God until these things are approved of God and then sealed into the kingdom of God. Amen. There's the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. There's the genuine works of God. It's sealed Amen. into the day of redemption. That was her dream. I thought it was beautiful. Now, therefore, when she does that, when that church comes to this place, or the individual, the church is going to be there. Amen. Let me say it real good so you get it. The church is predestinated to be there. Amen. I want to be with it. Amen. <laughs> But the only way I'll be with it is to be part of it. Amen. Amen. How do I become part of it? By being in it. How do I get in it? By baptism. By one spirit. First Corinthians 12. By one spirit, we are all baptized yes. into one body. Amen. One body. Baptized into it. But you can't stick these little things and say, I spoke a tongue. I got it. You go out here and angry and... Swear and carry on? That's putting peacock feathers in a a jaybird. (laughs) You can't do it. Your own life proves that it's not. But when these things are operating in you by God, then you're sealed. Then there's no put on about it. You're just yourself. That's when visions, perfect, Holy Spirit, works of God, Everything is made manifest because why? You and Christ become one. Amen. I hope that's understood. 
You and Christ become one. I had something else I had wrote down here I wanted to think of. Brings us to the place of life. Then you become, have eternal life. Now I've got the Greek lexicon here. The emphatic diglot. I studied the other day on a word. Now in John 14, or John 3, 16, we find one place that says, have everlasting life. Another place that says, have eternal life. But in the, Greek, in the Greek version, in the Hebrew, it says, life without end. In the Greek word, it has A-I-N-I-O-A-N. Almost like aeon. Aeon is a space that can't be, it's a number that can't be numbered. It's beyond millions, trillions, billions. But this is aeonian of time. Eternal life. And the English word for it is eternal. We know it is eternal, aeonian, or life without end. Amen. See? And if you've got life without end, how can you perish? Amen. You have become a part of the eternal. And there's only one thing eternal. Satan's not eternal. Amen. No. Amen. He, he becomes Satan. Hell is not eternal. Amen. Hell was created. Amen. It's not eternal. And... These bodies are not eternal. They were created. But the Spirit of God is eternal. It never had a beginning or it never has an end. And the only way we can have eternal life, from that Greek word zoe, which means God's own life, we have we become a part of God, but we become sons and daughters of God, and we have a eye in life. So the part that lives us that recognizes this word from here to there that recognizes is a onion life. Life without end is God's Amen. own life in us. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The other day on the trip I had a discussion. The Jehovah Witness. Now no disregard to anybody's belief. We got plenty of them converts sitting here from Jehovah Witness. One of our trustees of the church of Jehovah Witness was... And was saved him and his family. His father was a reader. Brother Woods and that. All of his brothers and sisters now. Not all of them come in and receive the Holy Ghost. Because of the visions of God. Tell them what they did and what they, see, had done it. Now, but here, Jehovah Witness in their uh, uh, book, it says that the breath that you breathe is the soul. Now, that cannot be right. The breath that you breathe is not soul. If it is, you're, you're one time, you're one kind of soul. Next time you're somebody else's breathe that soul, look where you'd be. Now, the breath is wind. And wind is what you breathe into your nostrils. Now, they take the scripture from back and God breathed breath into his nostrils. And he became a living soul. Now, I want to ask you something. If he was a man... What kind of a breath was he breathing before God breathed his breath of life into him? Yeah, amen. See? What kind of breath is a breathing living man? Amen. Well, then, if that be so, then every animal is a living soul. Because they breathe a human soul and our soul and all together. Then Jesus wouldn't have had to die. The animal sacrifice had been sufficient. Yeah, that's right. Help us, Lord. Amen. See, so, amen. brother, the argument don't stand. But what God did, He breathed the breath of eternal life. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. Then He becomes Lots of it. a living soul. Amen. A soul that can't die. Now, watch now. We're going to get into honey pump to your elbows. Amen. No, breathe the breath of eternal life into His nostrils. And He became an eternal Eternal soul. Because oh, God breathed, not what nature done, but what God did. Breathe the breath of life into his nostrils and he become a living soul. Then you say to me, Adam died, Brother Branham. But remember, before Adam died, he had a lamb that redeemed him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Those who he foreknew he has called. Yeah. He got a lamb to redeem him. He was a type. Adam fell. 
Then the lamb was provided for Adam because already in his nostrils had become the breath of the eternal God and he become a living soul. He was a son of God. Not his breath is the African word. I don't know what the Greek word is for it right now, but the African word is called Amalia, which means the wind, an unseen force. Animals breathe Amalia. Sinners breathe Amalia. Then why would we struggle for eternal life if that's the eternal soul breathed into us by breath? Why would we struggle for eternal life? Uh, it backfires, <laughs> See, it, it, it just can't do it. But God, especially upon Adam, breathed a breath of eternal life and he become an eternal person with God. Amen. He had power like God. Amen. He was an amateur God. Amen. He was God of the earth. Not God of heaven, now God of the earth. And someday the sons of God will again become gods. Jesus said, so is not it written in your law? You are gods? Amen. Yes, amen. Then if you can call those who can call God, who God visited, how can you condemn me? He said, when I say I'm the son of God. Hey? Now, we're getting into something deep. Now, watch this when we drive it down. Now, here they are. He is now a son of God, but he... Makes a mistake. He knows he's doing wrong. Now remember, Adam was not deceived. The Bible said so, 1 Timothy 3. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived within the transgression. Adam walked with Eve because it was his wife. Same as Christ, not deceived by Satan, but walked into the death with the bride. He went to be with the bride so he could redeem the church. Adam knew he was wrong. So he just walked out with Eve. See? But there was a lamb provided for them. That they were redeemed. And these lambs, today, that were foreknown by God and God has called, there is a redeemer. No man can come to me except my father draws him. And all the father has given me will come to me. Amen. Is that right? So there is a provided lamb from the foundation of the world where their names are put on the Lamb's book of life. A lamb was provided to make a way of grace for every one of them to go in the resurrection. A provided lamb. Adam's lamb. Now, notice, as Adam had a provided lamb. Now, that's the church today. I don't mean the, the church. You know what? I don't say this to be sacrilegious. And I don't mean it to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not here to do that. As I've already explained myself, I'm here to help. But what I'm trying to do, you know what? Actually, these churches are not churches. There's only one church. These are lodges. See? They are lodges. I ain't got nothing. It's all right. But I, I want to prove that to you in a few minutes. That they are merely lodges. You belong to the Methodist Lodge, to the Presbyterian Lodge, Amen. or to the Pentecostal Lodge, as far as Amen. that goes. <laughs> lodges, see? You cannot see churches are actually lodges where people with the same idea drift together. But the church is one. And you cannot join the church. You're born in it. And when you're born in it, you're a member of it. Just like my family. I've been in the Branham family for 53 years. They never did ask me to join the family. Why? I don't have to join the family. I was born to Branham. And you're born in the church. Now, these others are lodges. Did you ever think of that? Yes, sir. One day I was mowing grass. And I was thinking about, well, the great holy Catholic church, they call it. I was going along like that morning, and something stopped me just as stiff. I said, don't call that that. I looked around. I started mowing on. Again, it stopped me. I said, don't call them that. I said, they are a lodge like others. They are not church. There's one church. See? They are members of a lodge. Because you can join a lodge. But you can't join the church. The church, you're born in it. 
you become a member of it by new birth. Then a member of the family, a brother or sister in it. Now, let me just read you out of the emphatic diglot here something of Revelation 17, 3. And the apocalypse of the emphatic diglot here. And just watch this, how this reads and how, how beautiful it just compares with that. Revelation 16, 17. All right. Now let's read here just a minute. Listen to this real close. Revelation 17, 3. And one of those seven angels having seven bowls came and spoke to me. I'm reading you out of the election. Having come, I will show thee the judgment of that great whore who setteth upon many waters. And we all know that's the Vatican. Amen. Here we got our Sunday visitor in there from the Catholic Church telling us this exactly what it is. See? And this answer to it said, but wait a minute. Said there's been all kinds of names. Said we make 666. I said, but just a minute. Said your name might make 600. But I said, I don't set on seven hills ruling the world. Lord. See? <laughs> see, that's right. See? Show the judgment of the great whore. It setteth on many waters. Waters, Revelation 17, 15, is thickness and multitudes of people. See? With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornications and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of the, her fornications. Now what? And he conducted me in the spirit into a desert. The emphatic diglot now, see? And I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet cold beast full of blasphemous names. Now, in the King James says, full of names of blasphemy. Just a moment, I'll get it here. Tonight. Revelations the third, all right. Here it is. All right, uh, Revelation, I meant 17, not 7. Uh, 17, now listen to the third verse. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman setting up on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. That's the way the English give it. But the original Greek from the Diglot reads it like this in Revelation 17, 3. Now listen. And he conducted me in the spirit into a desert. And I saw a woman setting up on a scarlet colored beast, beast full of blasphemous names. That's a lot different. From names of blasphemy to blasphemous names. What is it? And we, and now, she was a mother of harlots. We all know that. Amen. Now, what is it? You don't have to be, well, that's right. That would take the Roman Catholic Church, but she's full of blasphemous names. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, all calling themselves churches of God. Yes. Blasphemous names. There's a lot of difference between names of blasphemy and blasphemous names. Call themselves a church of God and represent themselves before the world in card parties and drinking and carrying on the soup suppers and everything else and all kinds of stuff. So there's only one church you're born into it. Amen. You don't come in there until you're washed in the blood of the Lamb and sealed away by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. What a difference between names of blasphemy and blasphemous names. Amen. Get it? Oh, yes. Amen. I caught that this morning when I was reading here, the, coming down. Something just told me, go into your room, pick up the diaglot. No, well, it's just a little obedience, that's all. Yes. Walked in and I picked up Revelation 7. And I thought, why do you want me to read this part? And I started reading, Jesus struck it. There it is. I got a pencil and wrote it down. I said, there it is. Now they're hollering about me kicking against the organization. It's those blasphemous names that call themselves churches of God oh, and churches of Christ and churches of Methodists and churches of... It's lodges. Not churches. One church. That's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is it? The mystical body of Jesus Christ in operation on earth. Made up of a member of any of these congregations that would be a member of Christ's body. You have to be born into it, not joined into it. And to, to join in it is blasphemous names. This woman... This woman, her power, and you see right now where they're going to take all the people who's got odd ideas about religion and send to Alaska. You've seen that. All of our odd beliefs. And uh, what is it? The council, the world council of churches, and the Catholic has their big uh, uh, to-do going on in the Vatican now. Over there, the where they're trying, and all these bishops and so forth, they're trying to come to an agreement to fight communism. The world fighting communism and only joining up with Catholicism. And it's just like it is today. Here we are, as I said, we're, go, we're almost bankrupt. We're borrowing, spending money now on taxes that will be paid 14 years from today. That's how far we are gone. 
Who's got the money in the world? The Catholic Church. How would it be loaned to the United States to keep these tobacco and whiskey companies and things? Sure, they'll borrow it from when they do this. Sell their birthrights right out to the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. We consolidate. Amen. Watch this. Just plain, plain to read the newspaper. Here it is. See? They're Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and so forth, calling themselves the Church of God, Catholic, and all that kind of stuff. Is this beast power full of blasphemous names? Amen. Calling yourself. I, I'm. I said. I went to the hospital here not long ago. I was going to pray for a person. I said, uh, we're going to, it's my mother. I said, we're going to have prayer for a mother. And the lady said, draw that curtain. I said, aren't you a Christian? She said, we're a Methodist. I said, thank you. I thought maybe you was a believer. Now I just pull the curtain <laughs> out. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're not a Christian, that's different, see. But we're a Methodist. That's blasphemy. The beast. Churches. Call churches. They are not churches. Let me be sure that's on record. They are not churches. They are lodges. People join them. Amen. But you cannot join the church of the living God. You're born into it by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, these virtues are sealed in you by the Holy Ghost. And therefore, he that's born of God does not commit sin. Cannot. Praise the Lord. There you are. Oh, my. We just talk all day, couldn't we? The church is a mystical body of Christ, born of the breath of God. Oh, Did you get it? Amen. The church of God is born of the breath of God. Oh, God breathed God. breath into the nostrils spiritually of Adam, and he became a living soul. Oh, Did you know the Pentecostal, the true Pentecostal church, is born of the breath of God? Amen. Let me read you something just a minute. Just on. Let me see just a minute. St. John, I believe, where I'm going to. Let's find out where the church of God is or not. St. John, let's see, I believe that's about 16, 19, 20. All right? Here, I believe we'll have it right here. All right? Let me read you and see where the church is born of the breath of God or not, like Adam was in the beginning. What? And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Where then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus, and then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, so send I you. Watch. The Father that sent him went in him. And Jesus, when he sends a disciple, he goes in him. Same one sent. God. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Church born of the breath of God. Hallelujah. When this statue has molded itself up there in the condition, God's breath breathes upon him to receive the Holy Ghost. Ah. Then you are a son of God. You can join anything you want to, but you're born into the, the church of the living God. Born by the breath of God. God ah. breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, my. There you are. Not come and giant. Put your name on there and with your soup suppers and all goes with it. You join a lodge. You can join a Methodist lodge, Baptist lodge, Presbyterian lodge, Catholic lodge, or a Pentecostal lodge, anything you want to join. But you're joining a lodge. But when you become a child of God, you're born by the breath of God. Amen. Amen. But leave it alone right there now. All right. God's life is also then in you. Jesus said, just a minute. Jesus said, I am the vine. Ye are the branch. Now look, what was their fuss with Jesus? Their fuss with Jesus because he was a man making himself God. He was God. God was in Christ. See? And he told him, he said, hey, don't look at me. It's not me. It's my father. And he dwells in me. <laughs> See? Now, they was looking at that little body that was born to Mary. 
See, that wasn't God. That was the Son of God. But God was in that body. It was God. He said, if I do not the works of my Father, then condemn me. But which one of you can condemn me of sin? Unbelief of the Word. Which Word has God spoken that hasn't been fulfilled in me? Sin is unbelief. Which one of you accused me of sin? Sin is unbelief. Show me. If I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do the works of my... Though you can't believe me, believe the works that I do, for they testify. Otherwise, the Father's in me, testifying of Himself. Because God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. You get it? Oh, now, the same life that's in the vine is also in the branch. How are you going to join in that? It can't. I seen a tree not long ago, and Brother Sherry Chard in Arizona had nine different citrus fruits on it. What was it? It was a it was an orange tree, a navel orange. But it had a it had a, a lemon, a tangerine, a tangelo, and a grapefruit. It had all kinds. And I still look at that tree. And I said, Brother Sherry, you mean to tell me that that tree is an orange tree? He said, Sure. And I said, well, how, how come? I said, I see grapefruit here, tangerine here, tangelo here, and lemon here, and all these other fruits. How does it come? He said, well, you see, they're grafted in. Oh. I said, well, I want to ask you something. Now, you pick this grapefruit and lemon off. Now, next year, it will what? It will come forth then with an orange out of that oil. Then it will come forth with a lemon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> see? You can't do that. You can't join in. But he said every time that that tree gets a year older and puts out a new branch, it comes forth as oranges. If the vine itself puts out the branch. And what we try to do is be join members into him and we live under the name of Christianity because we are, as it's a, in a common way of saying, we are the citrus fruit, the Christian church. But when the vine itself puts forth a vine, it'll be like the first vine it put forth. Amen. If the first vine it put forth, they wrote a book of Acts behind it. If it ever puts forth another one, it'll write a book of Acts behind it. Amen. Right. So you're only joining lodges. Amen. But when you're born out of the vine, Amen. you got a fruit that's right. you got a fruit, but what do you do with it? You have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. You deny signs. You deny wonders. You deny the Holy Ghost. Amen. You deny speaking in tongues. You deny visions. You deny prophecies. You deny healing. And yet call yourself a name. No wonder the Holy Ghost said a power of a groups of people full of blasphemous names. Sure. Calling themselves Christians with forms of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For this is the sort that laid silly women laden with divers' lust, all kinds of organization. The church is packing so much with this kind of a society and that kind of a society. What about the society of Jesus Christ? See, we have all these other things, and we burden the church down. Now, there you are. You never can join a church. You join a lodge. You're a member of a lodge. Of a group of people, just like a lodge. We believe in this. We have our orders. We have our secrecy and so forth. You do the same way when you join a so-called church. But you cannot join church. You join the lodge of members, but not a church. For you are born into that church. And to bind itself down. Wait a minute. What? I'll close. After a while. Notice. Amen. Uh, Amen. Look, if God tempered this bride together with that spirit, Amen. then it tempers the individual together with that spirit. Amen. See, then you are born into that kingdom, and then the very life that was in this church is in that church, and that, 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 that. And the very life that was in the hall, the vine, Jesus, is in the member Amen. that he's put forth. Glory with the Amen. same things that I do, the works that I do, shall you do all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There's the true member of the oh, body of Christ. Christ. No kind of a name tacked on to it. Hallelujah. 
The very works of that individual proves where he comes Amen. from. So his life testifies what he is. Uh, are you what member? What body you belong to? The body of Christ. Well, where did you join? I didn't. I was born. <laughs> I was born in it. You don't have to tell them. They know what's happened. You just, how can you light a candle and put a bushel over it, he said. Oh, no, no. When you're born into that kingdom of God, then the life, the very life that was in Jesus, then you're interested in souls. Amen. Then you don't have to beg people to come to the altar. You don't have to beg for somebody to come seek with those that are at the altar. The, the things just automatically flow because it's sealed up in you. Amen. You are a unit of God. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost. Now, do you know what the Holy Ghost means? Hallelujah. It don't mean I jumped up and shouted and I had a strange feeling. That's all right. I've jumped up and shouted and had strange feeling. I spoke in tongues. I believe the Holy Ghost speaks in tongues. Sure. I've interpreted it. Yes, sir. I believe that too. But that ain't it. That is what I'm talking about. There can be a leak up here somewhere. There can be a leak here in your patience. <laughs> Yeah. Let somebody smite you on one side of the face. Do you turn the other? But you said that dirty hypocrite. Yeah. <laughs> then there's a leak somewhere sprung. <laughs> we better leave that alone. <laughs> All right. But you know what I mean. But when you're sealed into the body of Christ, then yeah. you're a spirit filled. And you're a son of God. Oh, I wish I just had about 10 minutes to read something here. But, uh, would you bear with me another ten minutes? I want to read something, just a little bit. I, I, honestly, the beans won't burn. I'll just assure you. See, if we'll just read this just for a few minutes, it's just too good to let go. I just got a couple things here that just comes on my mind, and I would like to say, let's turn to Saint John the third chapter, talking about life eternal. Let's just find out what it says here about this eternal life problem, God's life. Now, I watch here. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came therefore to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that our teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles except God be with him. Now, they, them Sanhedrin courts, they recognized that he was the son of God. They know it. Here was your ruler right here telling them. We know that your teacher comes from God because the very life of God flowing through you. We know that your teacher is not of your own. It's of God. Because God's proven it. See, the life of God's throwing right to you. Now what? <coughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Verily I say unto you, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh, my. Unless you join my church. Oh, see how you get it all? Jesus, then Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listeth. See, right back again. See? Coming back. See, the wind blows where it listeth. Thou canst not hear the sound, can hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it come or where it goes. So is everyone's born to the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and know not these things? Look at there, brother. A, a DD, PhD, double LD. <laughs> and know not these things. <laughs> Verily I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that which we have seen, and you receive not our witness. We know these things. We see them. We know it. And you don't even receive our witness. Church Jarner, see? If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now listen at this year. What? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that come down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Figure that one out. You know, one time he said, What well, thank you, Christ? Whose son is he? They said, The son of David. He said, Then why did David in the Spirit say to him, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down on my right hand. How can he be his Lord and his son? No man asked him anything. <laughs> in Revelation, he said, I am the root and the offspring of David. See? I am the vine and the branch. I'm the beginning. I was before the beginning. I was the beginning. And, and I was the offspring of him too. 
Now, here he said, No man has come down from heaven, but the Son of Man, which now is in heaven. Amen. Amen. A lady asked me one time a question. I said, Answer this one for me. I said, Who did Jesus pray to in the Garden of Gethsemane? I said, who was he talking about when he said, No man has ascended to heaven, but he that come down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in, which now is in heaven? Hmm? Here he is standing right here on a housetop talking to Nicodemus and said, I'm in heaven. <laughs> is that right? That's right. Let's leave that till tonight. What do you say? It's getting too late. Oh, now let's just ponder over that a little while this afternoon. How do you get in the church? Born. What by? The breath of God. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Spirit of the living God, breathe on me. That's my prayer. Just let the Holy Spirit breathe. Oh, my, for the breath of God. What is it? Sealed away in the kingdom of God. Knowing that when I first confessed I believe Jesus Christ. Yeah. Then to my faith I add virtue. Godly Amen. virtue. Then to my virtue I add knowledge of the Word. To my knowledge I add temperance, self-control. I like that. My country tis to thee. Crown thy soul with self-control. From sea to shine. See. Patience. Oh, my. Test it. Don't you worry. Satan will time for you. I'm climbing up the ladder now, see. I've added virtue, knowledge, tempers. Now I've got to add patience. I still ain't got the Holy Ghost. Now after I add patience, I add godliness. You know what that is? Like God. I right, add that. Right. Don't misbehave myself. Go like a Christian gentleman. Oh, true. Let that not be a put on something in me. The love of God is barling. Yes. See? Not say, ah, 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 boy, I could do it, but... Maybe I'd better not. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's there anyhow. It's a birth. I've been birthed into this, into this, into this, into this, into this, into this, into this. And then the love of God, Christ, comes down and seals all that up in me for certain. Uh, then what does he do when he gives me the Holy Ghost? He sets you out in a separate place to yourself. March him. See? Well, you're a different person then. You're not of the world no more. See, you're clothed different. You're dressed different. Not this outside dress. No, no, you don't have to be odd and peculiar and collar turned around, long ceremony like, no, no. You don't do that. You dress physically like this. It's a spiritual dress that counts. Amen. The wedding garment's been put on you. Amen. What are you? Like Jesus. What? He was overshadowed and he was transfigured there before him. And his ring would shine like the sun. There he was. Jesus. God placing his own son. And then up come Moses. Then up come Elijah. And Peter said, you know, it's, it's a good thing to be here. See how man gets? And all the supernatural. John said, let us build three tabernacles. Let's build one for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you. And before he got through speaking, God just shut the whole thing up. He said, this is my beloved son. In all these things that I required of Moses and put the law out by Moses, the justice by the prophets, he's met it all. Hear ye him. Amen. I'll step out of the picture now. Just hear him. <laughs> Just hear him. Oh, my. What a beautiful thing. Then, when we have met these qualifications and become full of the virtues of God and the things of God, then the Holy Spirit comes down and seals us into the kingdom. Don't worry. Everybody, I know you got it. You won't have to say, well, Glory to God, I know I got it. I spoke with tongues. Glory to God, I know I got it. I danced in the Spirit once. You won't have to say a word about it. Everybody will know you got it. Don't you worry. It'll testify for itself. You'll let it be known among man. God bless you. So glad to be here with you this morning. Had this time of fellowship. Listen, our little church is small, and yet we don't have enough room for the people who come here. We are not an organization. We believe and have fellowship with every organization. You just come here because that you want to come. And you, we love you and we want every organization, every person. I believe that there's people in all them organizations are Christians. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. 
So therefore, we have no strains, nothing to join, nothing to do, but just be a Christian. As E. Howard Cable used to say, we have no law but love, no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. That's right. Come and visit with us. We're happy to... We believe the full gospel, every bit of the word. We believe just exactly the way. We don't add one thing to it, take anything away from it, add any organization stuff to it. We just leave it just the way it is. That's it. And we're always glad to receive you. You come and be with us when you can. We pray for the sick. We believe everything the Bible says to you. We are forgetting our weaknesses behind him. We're pressing towards the mark of the Amen. Holy. Now, one thing more. Will you permit it to be said? Day before yesterday morning, you'll notice on the, vi- uh, the board out there a vision. I had a vision. It's about five o'clock, as my wife back there knows, or six. I woke up. We got up to get the children ready to go to school. I just had these now and then. And you all know, every one of you here, that they never fail. Amen. <laughs> they, Amen. they are absolutely perfect. See? They never fail. And I thought that I was the happiest person I ever seen. I was standing in the sun, S-U-N, and was, um, and was preaching the gospel to a large mammoth congregation. I just want to see if there's been tape. Um, a large mammoth congregation. And they were sitting in a forest. And streaks of the sun were shining down on them. Just here and there. Uh, getting it. Getting the word. And I'm, as usual, always too long. Too late. Preach too long. And I preach so long until the congregation become hungry for physical food. And they, some of them got tired. So they just got up, went out to get them some food, started going out. I said, don't, don't. I had two climaxes I wanted to meet, I wanted to meet in my sermon. And the Lord had given it to me. And any preacher knows when you really know it's, it, God's given it to you, you're just burning to tell the people. And I was just a preaching Charlie just as hard as I could preach. Just laying there on your own and saying, all these great things, this is what God's doing. Look at this. He discerns the thoughts of the heart. What is it, the Word? And going like that. Oh, I wish I could remember what I was saying, what my text was. I can't think of it. See? But I was just preaching away, and I was watching myself do it. And then when I stand there looking and watching myself preach it, and I was just preaching to who wouldn't have it. And after a bit, I raised up, you know, and I thought, glory to God. I said, look at these wonderful things. And this, that. And directly, I noticed the people getting get like it was physically hungry. And so they had enough spiritual... So they started walking away. And some of them started walking away. I thought, what's the matter with everybody? And, and I looked, and here's some young couples going along to my side. And I thought, I said, just a minute, friend, just a minute. You'll be back again when the evening shadows fall. <laughs> I said, you'll be back again. But let me give you this first climax. Where does all these things come from that I've showed you? Where are they from? I said, here they are. They're in the Word of God. They are, thus saith the Lord, His promise. Because I said, all of you bear me record. Witness this, that my commission is stay with the Word. I said, what's the matter with all of you? Can't you understand the Word? You must understand it. And someone said, man, I'd like to have some biscuits and so on. Like well, I just thought, well, glory to God. If they want biscuits, let them go get them. So I didn't. I turned around and I thought, oh, but you know what? The shadows is going to fall after a while, right away. And I said, then tonight, when that congregation gathers in again, now I put the climax to them and told them that the things that they have seen me do is found in the Word of God. Not in some mythical book or some organization. It's found in the Word. See, every bit of it in the Word calls them commission to that. I thought, you know, they'll everyone be back tonight. So here's what I'll do. I'll background, kind of background, you know the way I do it on these church ages and things, Say what I said before. I background it on the Word and then this great marvelous climax. I said, what a time it'll be. Praise be to God. And I've seen myself getting real little here. That praise be to God. i see myself fading up like that. And here I was standing there. Now, here's the interpretation thereof. 
me. The first thing that I have done, the things that's been done has been mythical to the people, most of them. I don't mean the full gospel and saints of God, but I mean most of the people. And you never want to look at the world cosmos as a message of God. When you go and you say, like Bose said, I've always said, I had a dream years ago that the, the God would send me to Chicago and shake Chicago for the glory of God. I said, Joseph, he's already done it. Why well, said they had not shaken since Moody? I said, that, I'm talking about the church. That's cannon fodder out there. That's just dust of the earth. That bunch cramming through the streets, painted Jesse Bells and everything. I said, that's out there. And them big old lodges and things will crumb and fall into the streets. And everything. I said, he's talking about the church. The church has seen the revelation of Jesus Christ made manifest. Amen. And they recognize it. They may not be 15 out of Chicago. They may not be 10 in this generation. Now the whole city of Chicago will come forth. Did you ever think of that? As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man, wherein eight souls were saved. <laughs> How many come out of Sodom? <laughs> see what I mean? I doubt being a handful. See? But the church itself has received the shake and they've recognized it. They know the word. They've seen the word when it was being materialized. And they caught it. Now, look at that for a minute. Now, and this first message, when they'd see it, everybody rallied for it. So, oh, glory to God. Oh, if I could see this, that, and they go right away the same way they come in. See? And now they think, well, I don't know. Where would you join? If I don't come with this, it'll be this way, and I'll be kicked out over here, and I won't have nothing to do here. And brother, sit down and say, well, what would I do if I see there? They won't stop long enough to recognize it's the word that God promised being manifested. See? And they walked away. But don't worry, the shadows are close at hand. See? When I return to the field, you remember the other night? Of the message that he gave me back when I was laying the cornerstone, just exactly said, do the work. Said, when you come out of this vision, read 2 Timothy 4. You know what's laying right there on the cornerstone 33 years ago? Said, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap teachers having itch and ears, turn from the fable, from truth unto fables. If that hasn't been just word by word. But remember then the other night when I never did read the rest of it. The thirty something years that I preached in this tabernacle, never one time did I ever go any farther than that, and I don't know why. I often wondered till one day I seen where Jesus picked up the scroll and began to read and read half of the prophecy and stopped and said there in Capernaum, he said, and this day this prophecy is fulfilled. Why didn't you read the rest of it? It pertains to his second coming. Amen. See? And there I'd read that not knowing. I picked up that, and there it was right before me at Southern Pines, South Carolina, that morning. Standing out there talking to Joseph Bolze, leaned up against the side of a car. I struck it. Paul said, I, all man has turned against me. There's no man with me. Demas has forsaken me, loving this present world. And I'm now re- looking the coppersmith dummy must run. Look what Demas must have thought. Why well, I seen Paul preach the gospel and heal the sick, and here he sits suffering himself, carrying a doctor along with him. Luke, all the time he goes, <laughs> taking a doctor with him. A man preaching about. Why well, I seen him smite a man blind? Said the Lord, rebuke thee, and you'll be blind for a season, and let the coppersmith run him out of a meeting. I guess he lost his power to smite man blind. Unless he lost his power to bind healing. God's turned against him. I don't think Demas went out into the world because Demas is of a, you know, his history. He was of a big, rich family. And he wanted to go with the rest of the crowd. But Paul, poor little Paul. What was it? God always lets a ministry get like that and then crowns it. He let Jesus get to a place, look there, when he could raise the dead. When he could do anything he wanted to. And let a Roman soldier jerk beard out of his face and spit in his face. Hit him on it. Put a rag around his face and said, Now, you, you know, they tell me you are a prophet. All of us stood around the reason. Hit him on the head and said, Now tell us which one hits you. He knows which one hit him. Amen. 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 Sure he did. Sure. See? But his ministry is fixing to be crowned. Amen. It always gets that spot where it seems like it's real, real weak, just about gone. Then God crowns it. Oh, Amen. Lord. <laughs> Let it happen. Amen. Let it happen, Lord. Let's bow our heads. I love you. I love because he first. I worship him. We've had hard teaching. And first, just my salvation. On Calvary Street. Let's
Let's raise up our hands out to Him. Ah, now be in the Spirit. See. I love Him. I love Him. Be shake hands with one another. The second verse, we're going to sing it to God. All right? And then we'll be dismissed. Now let's see. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort you. Take it Everywhere you go, precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, flower and joy of heaven, precious name. this now. I'm going to ask the little brother here that I had in the room a few minutes ago, a uh, precious little brother, a missionary to the assemblies in the wilderness up here. I forget what his name is. I'm going to ask him this missing prayer as soon as we sing this next verse. Take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. And when temptations around you gather, just breathe that holy name in prayer. Watch the devils leave then, see? Now remember, take the name of Jesus with you. As a shield from every snare. And when temptations around you gather, just stop and breathe that holy name in prayer. Watch what takes place. All right, all together now. Take the name of Jesus with you. As a shield from every snare. When temptations around you gather, what do you do now? Just breathe that holy name in prayer, precious name.